Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, day two, the service developer track. Um, and uh, we have a, a really interesting agenda for this afternoon uh, with uh, John Limblad, who's uh, uh, getting ready to get up on stage to, to present uh, his session about the eight cornerstones of, of automation, looking at some of the kind of bedrock aspects of, of uh, requirements you need to understand and, and cater um, take into account in order to achieve high levels of, of network automation. John was uh, is, is somebody I've known for about 24 years, I think. And he was, in fact, uh, the first person I was set to work with when I came out of university. So basically, the, 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 the person who was assigned to be my mentor and actually teach me something useful. So it's great to have John here uh, back on stage. Um, um, the stage is yours, John. The story continues. A few years later, he was my boss, actually. So <laughs> things, the, your luck can change in, in, uh, in this industry. <laughs> That's what you get for teaching something, uh, somebody every, everything you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you were a great boss, so that's, that's right. <laughs> Is your network management automated? Raise your hands or, s or shout out. There's not a lot of shouting, and I don't see many hands either. Actually, in, in this audience, I was expecting a little bit more. Let's try this again. Is your network management automated? Yeah. <laughs> okay, third time. Is your network management automated? You, uh, I would normally not go past a thing like this. I want uh, audience response every, all the time. But this is a trick question, so I'll let you go this time. Because this is not a yes or no question. There is a whole scale, a whole range of being a little, little bit automated to something that's very, very automated. In the car industry, they had a similar problem when they were getting introducing automation, self-driving cars. Because in the industry, yeah, our car is automated, self-driving, um, ours is also, but ours is much better than yours. Bec but they couldn't really talk about it because there was no terminology, no concept. What do you mean by automation? And we have the similar story here in network automation. Before I dive into network automation, let's ju just review this a little bit so you get the sense of what they did. The car industry came together and defined levels that are on Wikipedia today for what it means to be self-driving in a self-driving car. On level zero, you get warnings. It's not really automated or self-driving at that point, but you can at least, uh, maybe it can do emergency brakes. It's just the steering wheel starts to vibrate if you are crossing the line without your blinkers on and stuff like that. That's level zero. On level one, it is self-driving Sometimes, for example, when you're driving on the highway, it may keep the distance to the car in front of you, keep the lane. Uh, it may be able to park a car for you or something like that. So it's some sort. It is driving autonomously a little bit sometimes. With uh, level two, it is driving uh, autonomously much of the time, maybe most of the time. But the responsibility is still with the driver. You have to sit there and have the hands on the wheel. You are still responsible, you, are, you need to be monitoring, you, need to, you are still the guy that's driving. Uh, on level three, uh, you can take the eyes off the road. You're still, uh, you have to be there and be ready to take over at any time. But you will get an advance warning, a few seconds or a minute or something like this. So that now you, you it's up to you to drive now. But for, uh, for some time, the car is responsible for the driving. On level four, uh, you can basically take a nap in the car, and uh, it, if something, if a situation arises where the car cannot handle this uh, on its own, for example, you're leaving the map area where it knows how to drive, or it's too slippery or something, it will take you and park the car until you wake up. And on level five, you don't need a steering wheel anymore. So by having a sort of terminology like this, it's easier to have a conversation about what sort of automation we are talking about. And I thought we would do the same for network automation. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. 
Try this again. It was, it's not, it's not uh, totally out of line here, but okay, try it again. Yes. Oh, there we have it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we, I defined similarly uh, levels 0 through 5 for network automation, and see if you can follow me uh, in this discussion here. Level 0 is not really automated, but it's at least an embryo. You have um, your mobs in a Word document somewhere, page 58 or 558, depending on how old your organization is. And in there, uh, there are some snippets of commands that you're supposed to, when this happens, copy this and paste it into your terminals for the routers. Uh, and there's usually a middle step also. You have to take this Word thing into Notepad, replace a few things like the customer name, age number, and then paste it into the right window, right? Makes, you have seen this before? <laughs> no, some people say no. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I call level zero. Level one, then you have taken those mob documents and uh, basically taken those little snippets with those placeholder variables inside and turned them into small scripts that you can run individually. So instead of copying, pasting, you're looking, still looking at five, uh, page 558 in the MOPS document, but it says the name of the script you're supposed to run and which the arguments are. Uh, the first one is the AS number, second is customer name, whatever it is. And those scripts are more or less just doing the pasting. They are not very advanced at all. If something goes wrong, it's up to you. You pasted this, right? That's level one. On level two, we are taking the scripts all the way that they can go. So that's now these scripts have pre-flight checks, so ch checking is the environment suitable for running this now, or do we have all the things that we need, and post-flight checks, saying, did we get what we actually expected? They also have, uh, um, they, if something goes wrong in the middle for certain things, some things that we have foreseen, they might even clean up and go back to a previous known state or something like that. So, for, for many error situations, they are, they are cleaning things up. So that's level two. Does it make sense? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I would compare level two to uh, sort of, you know, self-guided vehicles that have some sort of tracks in their floor and they can follow this and they can, if somebody stands in the way, they will slowly stop and beep a little bit and stuff like that. This is level two automation for the networks. But if you want to go to level three, things are getting tougher. Uh, here, I, I call that model-driven services, uh, but if, if I compare this to the car industry again, this is more like the Paris-Dakar rally or something. You have to start with the city traffic in Paris, go through the mountains in Adora, across the desert in Sahara, and then you can go to the beach in Dakar. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to pre-plan that with a wire in the ground all the way. And there are, they may have, some situations may arise on the way that, you, that the programmers didn't really think of. So that you have to have some sort of autonomy, autonomy in the system now. You cannot pre-program every turn and every situation. The system needs to, it needs to understand the goal. I am supposed to do this, but the actual taking you from point A to point B needs to be autonomous here. And this is where it gets hard. In many situations, uh, there are, you can start on something small. You go uh, towards, uh, you want to build houses. OK, so I will build them, build them as wooden houses. That, makes, that takes you first to a cottage in the, in the forest. Maybe uh, a few hundred la years later, you can build two-story buildings in wood. Uh, maybe we can build even five, or now in, in Sweden, up north, you have 20, building, tw 20 stories uh, wooden houses. But at some point, you have to give in you have to change to a different material, for example, concrete. Uh, and then a lot of what you know about building houses has to be started over. OK, we are now doing the same thing, but in concrete. We have new tools, new ways of thinking, new planning process. All of these things are different. Same things for the, fossil, for the car industry. They have these fossil, fossil cars, and they have to go to electric cars. And a lot of things have to start over. It's not just changing the engine, and you're, do you're good. And we have the same thing in network automation. If you want to go to level two to level three, you have to cross the chasm. What does that look like? Here we have two real-world examples of automation systems. One is on level two, and the other one is on, say, level three to five. 
And uh, I mean, isn't this the same? How can you know that one is level two and one is level three? It's XML, and some variables with curly brackets and stuff. How can you see what is what here? Is this obvious to you? Do you see which one is which? If you take a look at this uh, level two script here, you see you have some XML stuff, but what you, if you read this carefully and understand what this means, it, this is one operation. It's something that you send to a router. Uh, it contains variables, but it only it's implementing this particular this particular thing that you are you, the activation that we're talking about here in one particular way over one particular protocol. This particular template can never do uh, modify an existing service. It can never delete anything. It can never be used on a different protocol. This is netconf, but it could never be used for a CLI activation. It could never adapt to the context, like if you're getting into Sahara and you need to think differently about water. This script, this particular activation script here won't cut it. It's, uh, you see this jigsaw puzzle fee here. I think of this as a sort of, it's a piece of something that you can, if you have uh, the right context, and this piece might fit in there. And some programmer can see, oh, this one is what I need here. I need to make a left turn. Okay, I'll put this piece here. But it's not something that uh, can fit just anywhere. With the level th uh, three script here, which is also XML and variables, what is described inside this script or this XML piece here is not an operation. It's a goal. It is point B, where I want to get to, that is being described. It's XML, it's variables, but it's not describing how you do that. It is describing what you want to have done. So there is no additional uh, template needed for deleting or modifying a service or using CLI or adapting to the context in some other way. You, this does describe the end goal. So if you want to go to level three, you have to give up your existing templates and tools that you used on level two. They won't cut it. Does it make sense? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. On level four, we have similar, uh, we, we are building on level three. Everything that you saw in level three is also in level four, but here we're also adding verified service delivery. And verified service delivery means that you're actually measuring not only that there's connectivity, but you are, that you are delivering the goal. If you are uh, delivering a video service, you are measuring the video quality. If you are uh, delivering, uh, you have to, you have an SLA, and the SLA says, this is what we're delivering, then whatever this SLA is talking about, that's what you have to measure, too. And you can measure, of course, when you are creating the service with a birth certificate. But it could also be that, I mean, many, thing, many aspects of the service needs to be continuously monitored over the life of this service. So that's what you should add if you want to call your network level four automated. Um, if you... If you went to a university and thought about system theory, one of the fundamental things you learned about there was the feedback loop. As soon as you want to have something to, to uh, behave in any way, the least sort of having an intelligent behavior or something like that, you absolutely have to have a feedback loop. You cannot build a system that behaves and adapts to the situation if you don't have a feedback loop. So that's just to, uh, if for level four, you, that's to, uh, this is to show why you need to measure your service. You have your, the system here in th that we are talking about is uh, delivering some sort of service. You need to monitor that with a sensor of some sort, feed it back to the controller that can adjust what the system is doing in order to achieve the goal. And on level five, uh, which I termed closed loop, we are, have, uh, we are adding planning, prevention, mitigation, and optimization aspects to the service. It needs to, li to live for a long time. And just when you are activating a service, uh, there will be changes in the environment. Some of them are very slow changing things. It takes decades for things to change. The, the types of equipment that's in the network, the sort of uh, underlay technologies that, you are, that are popular this day, things like that change slowly. Then you have other things that change more rapidly, but still fairly slow, like uh, the price of electricity or something like that changes over weeks and even hours. 
but then maybe you need to take to provision your service in a different way if you take this into account. Or some things that change very rapidly, like the sit traffic situation, it may change from one minute to the next. Uh, so when you are deploying a service into your network, once in a while, you have to redeploy that service in terms of what's the context look like now. Oh, maybe there's some new paths available that weren't available before. Maybe there's some new technologies that we want to use. Maybe the traffic is, is congested over here. Maybe the electricity is cheaper over there. I'm not telling you exactly how often you need to redeploy, but to call your automation level five uh, automated, you would have to have the concept of redeploying your services at certain intervals or certain situations to, take, to adapt to the current situation that we have in the network. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. So this is uh, based on uh, 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 this presentation slides that we saw now. These levels is something that uh, we described in a blog post. You can read, here's the link, uh, you will find it somewhere. Uh, if you want to read more details about it. Uh, Christian helped me a lot with this. Thank you, Christian. Um, to, to, I mean, I'm a more computer science guy, and to make this real in the networking world, I need somebody like Christian. So I'll bring up a couple of Slido poll questions. Let's see if this works now. We had some trouble around this. See if we can get Slido. I have a couple of questions for you. Can we bring up the first question? Whoever is operating the Slido thing here, uh, can you please bring up the first question? Thank you. Oh, you have already answered. Yeah, so uh, the first question was, if these levels make sense to you, do we want to go to ITF and make an information RFC to make sure the rest of the world knows about this too and use the same language? And uh, I wanted to bring this quote to you, but you have already responded. Oh, <laughs> uh, can we go back to the previous one? I didn't quite see. Okay, and the first, yeah, uh, uh, a whole lot of uh, people think that this would be a good idea. And we have a few candidates that want to be helping me out to, to do this in ITF. Whoa, applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next question, please. And uh, where are you now? Around level three. Yeah, actually, I thought uh, you would realize by now that level three is when you have NSO, you have level three. So that's great. <laughs> and uh, some of people have already, uh, one fifth have already reached higher levels with level four and level five. And I think that's really great. <laughs> and uh, did we have one more question? Yeah. Where do you see things you will be in uh, five to seven years from now? And almost uh, over three quarters think that they will be on level four or five. And that's really nice. Good to hear. <laughs> Thank you. We can close the poll now because we have the rest of the slider poll questions uh, will go at the end. Thank you. Then we get into the cornerstones. This was the first part here, establishing the levels. But you will see some of the levels come back into the, the cornerstones here. So uh, this is some uh, nice, uh, nice house in Italy. And uh, the first cornerstone I want to talk about is being service-centric. If you want to cross the chasm and get over to uh, high-level automation, there are, I mean, there are some things you need to think about in order to get across. And the first thing here is this first cornerstone is being service-centric. So 
if you look at this uh, piece of CLI text here, um, and then you have another piece of CLI text here, there are, uh, people have told me, people that understand networking have told me these are services. I don't know exactly what they do, but it's, uh, uh, I'm not a networking guy, as I said. But it, it's, uh, not only are they services, but they are also basically the same service. It's one is for a Cisco device and one is for another device. And they describe this, but on a very device-centric way, right? And what I want to say is that if you want to go to higher automation levels and cross the chasm, we need to be service-centric. We need to extract the important information from this and put that into a sort of vendor-neutral, high-level abstract model. So here we have the same information, same service again in a third way, but this one is not attached to a particular device, device type. So it's implementation dependent, uh, independent. Uh, the second cornerstone is being template-based. And to explain what I mean by that, I'm asking you a question. Okay, how does, I mean, I have been in many situations where I go out and meet somebody who has a network or some function uh, that they want to automate. And what I ask always is, okay, what is your service doing? And if I ask you, okay, I, I'm, what is this thing that, that we are trying to talk about today? What is this service really doing? How would you describe it back to me? I've done this a lot, so I know what, you, what the true answer is here. Anybody want any volunteers to say how you would describe it to me? No volunteers. Okay, that's fine. We, we have uh, other opportunities to speak up later. I'll tell you that once we get into the details, you'll describe the service that, you, that we're talking about as a, as a collection of CLI commands, or maybe pseudo CLI commands, right? This is basically, that is the language that we use to express our ideas. It is CLI language. Uh, in particular, you will describe it as a, s a bunch of CLI commands as a template with some placeholders. And it will be the creation case that you describe to me. How this is how I create this service. This has never been failed. It's always exactly like this. Always CLI commands with placeholders, and it's only about the create case. And uh, if I ask, delete case or modify case, yeah, yeah, you do it like this. That's, it's in your heads, but that's never what comes up if I ask. So it seems to me then that Homo sapiens network ensis is thinking in terms of config snippets through CLI. That is, that is the way that we operate in our heads when we think about and model or, or think about the, the way that this operates. And the question is now, we are talking about automation, so we are trying to get your brains out of the loop a little bit. So the question is, can we make computers do the same? Or can we interface with the computers using templates still? And sure, uh, yeah, we can, we can use CLIs for, for automating, and we can certainly use templates, but the CLI part of it is not really, it's not ideal for this. It, they are not, uh, CLI commands uh, used for automation is not the perfect way to, uh, to operate because they don't have this well-defined behavior. They don't work the same across different vendors. There are often side effects. If you say this command, whatever the command states in text, the obvious meaning it is implementing, but it's also doing two other things that it didn't tell about. Uh, error messages uh, are kind of hard. Uh, an op a, a human might understand that this is an error message or a warning, but a computer might have, have difficulty to understand, is this an error? Is it a warning? Is it just an info, info message? Is this the result of something? Uh, we don't know. And uh, transactionality, some CLIs have that, some don't. It's, it's not an ideal foundation with such a nebulous base. But we do want to keep templates because that's how we operate. So those uh, cornerstone number three here, being declarative. So now that we want to keep templates, that's how we think and we want to think that way, so that's a good thing to keep. But we want these templates to be declarative, not templates about operations, they should be about the goals. They, so the templates on the left here, they are CLI commands in a particular order with variables. There's one for create, there's one for delete, there's one for modify in this way, and there's another one for modify in that way, and so on. The, the number of templates grows very large. Whereas on the other side, uh, we have this, we only describe it the create case, just as we do in our heads. 
We don't want to mess around with how do you delete, how do you modify. It, we, the system can figure that, figure that out on its own. And these declarative templates, they, are, they don't uh, talk about which operation it is. They don't talk about which protocol is being used. They, they don't have any sort of internal sequencing. If they are creating multiple things, we could run them towards a device in a different order, maybe, because they have to be run in a different order. We don't care about the ordering inside these declarative templates. Make sense? Great. Cornerstone number four is being stateful. So if you have a, a stateless management system, it will have a number of these templates, basically operations that you can apply. I think op op uh, template number 44 is good right now, and 68 is, is good after that to move from this state zero to state one, or from state one to state two. Uh, the good thing about being stateless is that you don't need any sort of information about the system. You see, uh, oh, we are now in a situation where we want to apply template 44, and we go with that. Whereas in the stateful management, uh, what we describe are not the operations, but the goals instead. So basically the states. We are describing 0, 1, and 2. And then we are letting the system compute how do I navigate from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 2. And one of the advantages with this approach is, of course, that if you happen to land in the question mark state, somewhere in the middle, in the weeds, you can still say, well, please get me to state two. Whereas if you're on the left side, it's kind of, you don't have any template, no matter how many you have of those, that actually <laughs> corresponds to getting from question mark to two. Make sense? And you may have seen them, uh, you may have experienced them, that are managers that are stateless. <laughs> managers that, that they have a catalog of operations, they know, there's so we have the performance review, we have, you know, and uh, they don't know much about the, the company, not much about the product, and especially not much about you, but they still have these operations. And, or you have the other type of manager that understands the product, the company, you, and what's going on, and, uh, uh, you're, I think most of you are old enough to understand my point here. The fifth cornerstone is being model-driven. So we have uh, uh, the Yang schema language that describes uh, models, uh, that describes what you can do with your system. You have these uh, configurations that you can create. Uh, you have the operational state that you can query. You have actions that you can execute and the notifications that you may receive from a system. So that's basically the API definition of a system. There's a bunch of other schema languages around if you want, but I prefer Yang. Uh, there's SMI that you used in the SNMP world. XML schema descriptions was popular for a while. Uh, UML, but uh, UML alone is not doing this, but UML plus some English text could be a sort of interface description. Uh, some people like this open API or Swagger, JSON schema with YAML. The point is, it's important to be able to reason about the system, so you have to have a language to describe the API in some way. So, and the, the operations that you can execute towards the system and understand what's going to happen when you execute them. Cornerstone number six is being transactional. But before I get into the, what I mean exactly by transactional, I can, uh, people get hung up about this green and not so green picture here. So let me explain that first. So if you look on the left side, you see this all green picture. The green color means this is something you have to build on your own. So if you want to build a traditional NMS design, you have to build all the pieces. Uh, on the top, you have the user interface and the APIs that you want to have in your system. You have a, typically a web UI, maybe some REST interface or something. Then you have a layer of business logic below. That is the, uh, the, the part of this NMS that understands the service that you are going to provision. Let's say you're provisioning VPNs. So this is the one that understands what the VPN consists of, how you actually deploy that in terms of the equipment that you have in your network. Uh, under that, there's usually a, a layer of error handling, uh, and below the error handling part, you have the actual device touching templates or scripts or whatever that is pushing the idea of the business logic into the, all the devices that need to participate. This is a traditional thing. Uh, 
with uh, an NSO design, uh, of course, you don't need to have uh, to do anything for the northbound, really. You have a Python and Java APIs, you have command line interfaces and web, you have restconf and netconf, because that's all given by the model-driven nature, right? And uh, towards the bottom, you also have, you have the NEDs with the Yang model, and you have the NED logic there. For most people, that is given, and you don't have to program that at all. But if you look at the traditional NMS, most of the code in NMS, more than half of it, is error detection and error handling, if, this is, uh, if you are talking about a mature NMS system. And this is not just me saying that, uh, my competitors are saying the same. Uh, for, uh, if, you have a, if you're building something new, it, it probably not half of the code will be error handling and detection because you haven't figured out all the things you need to check for and handle yet. But in a mature system that's been out there for, for decades, that is what you find. That's where they converge. More than half of the code is about that. But that's a lot of code. Uh, it's also a, a complicated code, more complicated than most of the code in the DMS. Doing front-end code is way easier than to do error handling and detection. So if you compute the cost of an NMS, most of the cost sits in the error handling part. And it's also kind of painful process to arrive at that because uh, not, not many people could predict what this error handling part should look like 10 years ahead. There's no specification for that part. I mean, for the web UI and the business logic, there probably somebody wrote a document to say what's supposed to go in there, but for error handling, that was blank. So that's something that you have to figure out over time as you go. And that's not, from a business perspective, it's not ideal. Then when you look at this business uh, logic part, uh, you can see also in the NSO system, we have the Yang model there. It's definitely part of the business logic. It's a service model. And then you have the create code. That's why this business logic is only partly green, because the create is what you have to deal with and not the uh, delete and modify. I'll explain that in the next, on the next slide. But anyway, this is uh, trying to say that if you, if you want to save time and energy and get some quality earlier in the process, uh, having some automatic transaction handling is really good for your system. So I'll, I'll call that a cornerstone. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Because at some point, somebody's going to have clean up. The number seven here, cornerstone number seven, is the create only. And that's uh, the explanation of how, this, how, can, how it is possible that we can have uh, services, service logic, that only cares about the create case. What about the delete and the modify? They are just as important, aren't they? They are important, but you don't have to worry about them in the NSO. And this is, uh, this is why. This create only thing is what we usually call fast map. Basically, how it works is, OK, so if an operator sits inside NSO and uh, creates a service instance, yeah, I like one or more of these VPNs. Here are the endpoints, and here's the bandwidth, and here's the quality, whatever. That lands as a callback into the business logic, the service application for that VPN service. So it's NSO that is invoking this logic, this code, and sending in all the parameters that you need for this. So it's going through the NSO API into this business logic. And this business logic is then taking this input data and expressing that in terms of what you need to do towards the network. Oh, here's what you need to program, and here's what you need to set, and here's the, all these things. And uh, since this is an NSO API to some code, back to NSO APIs, it's an ideal spying situation. We know exactly what, you're f what we're feeding in. We know exactly what we're getting out. And NSO is observing exactly this. What's going on here? We know exactly what, what's happening. And this, uh, all the things that this business logic is doing towards the network, we are recording into the database. As, uh, in, uh, you see this little blue database sign there, uh, symbol there. But actually, we are not saving that information exactly. Um, we are doing uh, something reverse. We are doing, saving the undo information. If I were to characterize what is NSO most of all, I say NSO in heart and soul is a transaction manager. It's a database-like uh, related concept. A transaction manager is something that can compute. If you have one set of data here and another set of data here, how do I go between them? That is what NSO is really good at doing. It's a transaction manager. How do I get from here to here? But just as easily as going from here to here, 
I can, of course, in and so swap the arguments and say, how do I get from here to here and get the reverse? It's just a matter of switching places for a call, function call. To compute the inverse, how do I get back from when I, once I get there, how do I get back? And that's the information that we save in the undo information. How do I get back? Once I had deployed this, how do I get back? And save that into the database. And also, and it's always looking at what is the network situation now and where, what is the situation I want it to be, and computing the minimal diff for going from one to the other. So that's the other thing it's computing. I mean, the service logic, the business logic here might very well create something or say that we should set something to 14 when it is already 14. OK, so we compute the minimal diff for getting from here to here so that we know exactly these are the things that need to change. That's how the create code or create case works. And that makes the delete cases really, really simple because in order to take something away that we configured, this particular service, VPN service instance should now go away. We just apply the undo information. We already previously computed how I take it away. So we do that. Easy as that. No code required by the programmer. And uh, usually the modify case is the hardest one to program in a traditional NMS because there's just so many ways you can uh, modify a service. Oh, w what if you modify this parameter or that parameter or both? Or you know, it goes on. It's the combinatorial uh, explosion happens very quickly there. But the NSO will take care of that too because if, if an operator goes in there and changes a few of the parameters, we will invoke. We will first apply this undo information to take it, to take the previous incarnation of this service instance away completely, and then run the create code as if it was run afresh. But this is all happening in the memory of NSO and not on the network, so the devices don't know about this. And then we are computing a new undo information, saving that. This is a new footprint of this service instance, and then computing a new minimal diff. Well, if you're modifying a service, probably most of the stuff that this service logic created was already in the network. And we see that, oh, actually, it was only two things that we needed to change. And that's those two things are what we are setting out. Make sense? You have all heard this story before so many times, I think, most of you anyway. But it's good to return to basics. This is too important to understand. Why is this important? It's a cornerstone for get, uh, getting across this network automation chasm. We are actually not alone in coming up with this create-only strategy. Or uh, <laughs> If you are using Terraform, for example, you are used to this. You have your templates in Terraform where you describe how a particular uh, VM is being spun up. I mean, Terraform is a tool to spin up virtual machines, right? So uh, you're describing how you spin up a virtual machine, and you don't need to worry about the delete or modify cases there either. Because if you want to delete it, you delete a VM. And if you want to modify, you delete a VM and create a new one. Um, and I mean, Terraform is great if you're working with VMs, and it's OK for you to spin up new VMs when you want to change things. And the last cornerstone I want to talk about is uh, composability. It's, of course, key that you don't have one monolithic system where you have to build everything into one structure so that you can build smaller things like, oh, here's the component that deals with how you, the NED for this device, and here's the UI for this thing, and here's the business logic for this thing, so that you can build a structure out of smaller components, just like Lego. So it's, it's very much key to have this package concept or component concept where you can build things on top of each other in different ways. So with that, uh, we have gone through all these uh, cornerstones. Uh, and I'd like to summarize things a little bit. So uh, if you want to go from level two to level three uh, and develop a service, it's always important to start with your vision. What is it that you want the system to do and how, uh, what is it that you want to achieve? What is your goal? And then you model your service in Yang. And by the nature of this model-driven architecture, you get a user interface and a database schema automatically generated for you. And then you load up the network element drivers uh, that are relevant for your network. Uh, then that gives you the lower level the Yang and uh, device connectivity. 
And then you can add your declarative templates for the devices and or services. If you're on the bottom layer, uh, that will be for devices. But if you're higher up in the tree of components, the things below you will not be devices, but services, other low-level services. And uh, then you add your service code to that if you need. And that's the way you get things done. And now we have a few minutes to play. Uh, I'll check your, uh, if you have paid attention. It sounded like you paid pretty good attention. Uh, but I will be asking you uh, questions with, uh, where you respond back to what we talked about earlier. And in order to entice you to stand up and uh, answer, we have one copy of this nice little book that I will uh, be handing out to one of, one of the people that answer. We'll see exactly who, but if you are participating in answering to one of these questions, you are eligible to uh, have a chance to get the book. Well, okay. Um, this is a book uh, that has about that talks about uh, network programmability in Yang. It's uh, a sort of, I mean, I think NetConf and Yang and all this, they're very good RFCs. So if you really want to go all the way down and understand this technology, go and uh, um, read those RFCs. They are very readable. But if you want to take a shortcut and understand enough and get the main points uh, on the tour, you can go and read this book. It's trying to answer not so much the question is about how, but more about why. What is the point with this? Why is it important? And those things. And of course, uh, I'm one of the three authors of this book. So, but, uh, so that's why I can hand out copies of it. OK, let's see. We have these automation levels in self-driving networks. We defined six different levels, 0 to 5. Who remembers what level zero was? Yeah, it was called text templates, but it's absolutely about copy and pasting things from Word. Great, who, who was first to answer? I don't know. Yeah, OK, y you have to remember yourself if you uh, answered one of these questions. I, I, with these lights in my face, I hardly even see you. I just, I just hear you sometimes. OK, uh, on level one, what's level one? Uh, so many people answering at the same time, that's great, but... <laughs> yes, absolutely, macro scripts with uh, little in terms of pre and post checks, uh, and there's no cleanup or anything like that. What's level two? I think somebody up here was saying something about adapters uh, or adaptive activation scripts. Uh, so that's when you are adding these pre-flight checks and post-flight checks and uh, clean up for many of the things that the programmer happened to foresee. So there's some error detection and handling for known problems that may arise or common problems that may arise. What's level three? I think I heard it mostly from, I don't know exactly who is there. Oh, is you somewhere? Great, <laughs> you're listening carefully. Uh, uh, Model-driven services. Uh, that's when you start to, when you, really, when you don't hold the steering wheel anymore. The, in a car, the, you're moving the responsibility of the driving uh, experience from the driver to the car when you move from level two to level three. And it's the same thing here with networking. This is where you are no longer, there's no longer a programmer that holds the system what commands to send to the device. Now it is computed by the system. So it's a quite a, the, the big chasm in many of these situations is between two and three. This is where you lost touch with the ground. Oh, so I already gave this one away. Can somebody explain what this uh, verified service delivery is? Feedback loop, excellent, thank you. And what's level five? Closed loop. Closed loop, excellent. That's when you have to consider optimization, redeploying things after adapting to the context that changes over time. Great, it's my time to applaud you. <laughs> But there are more questions. We want to cross the chasm, and we talked about eight cornerstones. So 
who can explain cornerstone, the cornerstone number one here, service centric? What does it mean to be service centric? Absolutely, uh, platform independent is a little bit higher level description of the service. You are trying to f focus on what you want, what the goal is, and capture that in an abstract level. You don't talk about what you're doing to individual devices anymore. That is being service-centric. Thank you. Template-based, what does it mean? Absolutely, we are still thinking in, um, the Homo sapiens networkensis is still thinking in terms of templates with variables, and we should keep doing that because we are good at that and we like that, but we should refocus those templates not to be about individual operations, but to be about the goals that we want to achieve. What does create only mean? Exactly, so we only need to dis explain uh, how we create things and not bother about deletion and modification, which is a lot of uh, cases to care about. Excellent. What's declarative? Shout out. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. We only describe the end state and not how we get there, but also like it's uh, protocol independent, it's about, mm, you don't have to worry about sequencing and, and many other low level aspects like that. So that's being declarative, absolutely. What's transactional? Able to handle rollbacks, uh, failure and rollbacks. Absolutely, being able to handle uh, failure and, and do rollbacks. So I would say it's, it's this all or nothing uh, thing that people usually think about when it comes to transactions. It either happens completely or it doesn't happen at all. And you don't have to worry about uh, writing the recovery code for that. What's stateful? Being able to navigate from one state to another. Yes, absolutely. I, I'd say also that uh, it's being uh, understanding what the situation is right now. Having situational awareness. We know what the network is like at this point, so we can reason about what the best way to navigate from here to there is. It's not like one of those manners that you have seen. What's composable? Excellent. Yes, it's the uh, ability to, like Lego-like way, compose pieces of the puzzle, uh, small components that do one thing, th and you can use many of them and reuse them in new products. Exactly like that. And we have, finally, model-driven. What is model-driven? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, interpret the model and, uh, and act based on that. Yes, I'd, I'd say that model driven, uh, just as to say, it's uh, when you're describing or making a model and then deriving other things from that. For example, use interface, database schemas, uh, in implicit imp operations and stuff like that. So when you're creating the API, you're putting together this model that describes what you can do with the system and everything else derives from that. Excellent. Uh, I don't know exactly who was uh, answering to these questions. If you all uh, that were answering questions could come down here uh, um, so that I can choose who should have the book. 
I don't know who answered, but you know who, if you answered, so please come down here. <laughs> While we are doing this, uh, we can bring up the second slider poll. Yeah, you can come up on stage, that's fine. But I think there was more than three people that, uh, Samuel, you were also answering stuff. I, I don't know who was answering, so you have to be conscious. Uh, please come up here and... Uh, the, the chance of this guy is better if you don't come, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think that matters. If you have a copy of the book already, that is, doesn't matter. You can give it to somebody else if you want, but... Uh, So you can take a guess, you can feel it. Uh, how, many, uh, how many grams is this? Um, you can pass it on. 252. 252. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 215. 280. 280. Yeah, we can give it to David. <laughs> Thank you. It's 1,024, I think. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's what happens with biased thinking. Somebody gives an anchor and everybody follows. Okay, so as an industry going forward, what do we need most? Do we need more abstraction and less detail control? Or do we need more abstraction and more detail control, and then, by consequence, more complexity into the solution? Or do we need less abstraction and more details? But I think, quite overwhelmingly, we need more abstraction. That's interesting to hear. That's good for us to know when we are developing our products uh, further, that the more we can abstract, the better for you. Thank you. Next. All right. Uh, as an industry going forward, what do we need most? We need uh, reliability, security, and performance. Uh, ease of development is also important, but it's dramatically lower number, oh, not so dramatically, uh, lower number than reliability and security. <coughs> and we often hear performance, 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 but it actually, in this audience at least, it's uh, uh, a lower number than the others. And the last one, please. Uh, do we need better integration of workflows and transactions? Oh, this is, this is an interesting match. We have to watch for a while. And or better integration of config management with telemetry processing and sustainability? Or development tools? Yeah, we're focused less on development tools in the history, and uh, it seems that by natural selection, the people that are still in the room here don't need tools so much. I'll leave this up for a moment. Uh, it's, uh, the leading answer is, is varying all the time. Ah, we call it re reasonably even between those two, and uh, tools is less important. Thank you for the Slido. Uh, we can go on here. So uh, with these uh, automation levels and these cornerstones, um, I think there's, uh, we have a good way, a good chance of crossing the network automation chasm. And uh, I think some of the, if you are interested uh, in learning more about these things, you have this blog post you can read, and of course the, the book here that I'm, uh, I think it can be useful if you want to read more in depth about these things. And that's all I had. Thank you very much.